their side, you know, it's early, early, early journeys, so a very beginner talk, so I, I hope you all don't get too bored. Um, yeah. I guess for me, the, the first question with anything is why functional? Why do you care about functional programming? Um, the big kick for us, or for me recently, has been we've had a, a couple of guys joining our team, who, one of which is particularly good at functional programming, and you know, we knew we were hiring him, but that's how we were going to get beaten our heads. And I guess knowing before, before that happened, though, knowing that um, learning about the trade and, and about programming is a, a really important thing. And you know that's one of the awesome things about programming. I, I do a couple of talks to like uni students about beginning programming. And one of the things that I always try and get into their head is, you know, it's awesome. We get to keep on learning new stuff and keep on improving what we're doing. And that's one of the, the most awesome things. And I think functional programming for me, even if I never use Haskell or Scala in my daily life, when I write Java now, I, you get this voice in my head that's got side effects. <laughs> Stop, think, what are you doing? And, and it's, it's just really good for, for helping, I think, already making me a better programmer. And I guess that continual learning is, is great. It's also helping me spot duplication more and more. So as you're, you're writing Java code and you think, yep, that's a map function. I, I know that I've written that code like 10 times before. Um, and that'll actually be, as, as I sort of go through today, I'll be going through um, just some recursion and going through fold left and fold right, which hopefully isn't completely boring for people. Even if it is, it'll be a good reminder for how a beginner goes through learning things. Um, and I guess, so you, you, as functional, there's just these building up better and better layers of abstractions of, of things, and, and that's just such a powerful tool. And to be able to take what you can to whatever you do in, in programming is, is a good thing. And I guess, you know, again, the, the tiny voice in the back of my head is saying you get more correct as well. You can, you can improve your functional, your functional programs and uh, that's you know, another good thing. So I'm going to give some definitions which aren't complete. They're just, I guess, my mental map of where I'm at in my understanding. Um, I'm going to use, for me, probably newbie terms and, you know, again, talk to Tony or one of the other guys here for, for better terms or better definitions of things. So functional versus imperative. I guess you're, you're working as, as functions. Um, the, the function is a first class citizen, so that whole uh, lambda, being able to pass around a function, being able to work with it, um, a really clean way of being able to think about things and work with work with your functions. The no side effects. So I think for someone coming from an object-oriented background, that whole idea of a side effect, you do something and something else happens just sort of behind the scenes. That's, I guess, the idea of a side effect. Is people with me? Side effects? Good, bad? Bad, I hope. Um, as, you, as you're doing your Java programming or your object-oriented programming, you're thinking, okay, it, in terms of side effects is often a thing that you need to do. And I guess that idea of writing pure functions where there are no side effects is, is one of the goals with functional programming. That idea that, that everything is an expression and you're not always doing evaluation. So one of the most important things, I think, as a beginner doing functional programming and is, is the idea of recursion. I think you know, some of the old school object oriented guys are, are taught that recursion is bad because it doesn't perform well and, and don't do recursion. I think that's you know, sort of the mindset that you get out of and start thinking about in, in functional is really work hard at getting re recursion. So you know, the, the old science fiction thing that you're rocking something, so really, really, really in the deep of everything that you do, you really understand how to do recursion. And I think I, before, so I guess I really started doing functional programming probably in the past six months, or really started learning. But before I had a, a bit of a, a bit of a go at the little schema, and the little schema really pushes your recursion thinking. At least as far as I got, I was getting up to really getting recursion, and it was bashing my head in to really learn recursion. And I think that's important is to go back and um, 
do what you can to, to learn recursion. So if you're just starting functional, one of the first things is to really get recursion in a non-functional language, I think even, and really, yeah, get, get how to, to think in that sort of mindset. And then once you, you can start thinking about recursion, there's you know, some really nice, I guess, abstractions that you can put on top of it. So the, the basic idea of recursion is, and I've got sort of a, apologies, but my, or maybe not, the examples are going to be Haskell-ish, probably pretty much Haskell. Um, so I've got a recurse function over an array of x giving some y. And so the, the basic pattern that most recursion sort of boils down to is something like this. You've got an initial value when you've got the empty, empty list, and then recursing over it, you apply some function and then recurs again. So in terms of a like example, so sum and prod, so summing a list of integers or adding them all up, or a prod, multiplication of a list of integers. Start the empty list for sum is zero, starts at zero, um, and then you add to the recursion um, cases how you do sum. Um, for prod, which is multiplication based, so this is multiplying out a, a list of numbers. The zero case is, well, the empty list case, not the zero case, but the, the empty list case, you start with one and then multiplying out. So if we look at those side by side, we can see, hey, they look pretty similar. Um, there's a, a base case, some operation that you're applying. The base case of one or zero, plus or multiplication for the operation. It's, you know, there's a pattern there. There's, there's some sort of, there's duplication there. Let's get rid of the duke. So, you know, I'm not gonna go through and implement fold left, but you can, and it's not that hard. But it's a, a function, so a standard function in Haskell, that your, it's a function of, that takes in a function, so I'm gonna cheat and just treat them all as though they're arguments coming in takes in a function of a's and b's and gives out an a. It takes in an initial value, it takes in an array, and it gives an output value. So, our example, and the rate that I'm going through the slides is gonna be a short talk, so live with it. <laughs> so, our, our two bits of code from before, our sum is fold left, on the, the plus sort of operation starting with zero. And then the same for multiplication. So you can see that that's kind of a, a really nice sort of abstraction that you see that, that's there. To compare that with that, I mean, it's, you know, I guess you're, if you're having lines of code, it's only two lines of code going down to one line of code. But if you think about the, the duplication of, and the, I guess, the additional abstraction that you're doing there, that's just so much nicer. There's nothing there that's duplicated. It's, you know, I'm applying the fold left function on this other function with a starting value. There's, you, I, I don't know. It's almost beautiful. Okay, so fold left. Um, I think of it kind of like, you know, like the Pac-Man. You got the Pac-Man going across from the the left, he's chomping through your your list. Um, what there should be is like a, a little pile collecting up here. <laughs> so you can imagine the little pile collecting up here. He's chomping through the list and he's outputting something. And then you know there's another little bit here that's a starting value. Uh, so what is that output exactly? Fold <laughs> right, fold R. Um, yeah, it's kind of the reverse. You're starting on the right. So the type of fold R, it's kind of, the function looks a bit different. So the order of the parameters for the function from fold right to fold left is a bit, a bit different. So if I flip back. From in fold left it's A, B, A. Fold 
all right, it's A, B, B. So the A's and B's are kind of swapped. That's not helpful, probably. You, um, I guess have a look at your GHCI and you'll see. But I mean, essentially, the order of the parameters is different, but it's kind of just conceptually, it's working on the other way. Um, fold left and fold right, they work. You'd use them in different ways. So fold right, you'd use if you're building a list of something as an output, I think, if I'm, I'm not smoking crack. Um, it's, it depends on how you want to evaluate the parameters, so, yeah. Oh, <laughs> 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 These are the, the tools that I've been using for learning. Um, I think essentially having a person that you can talk to that knows stuff is, is always good. Um, yeah, we, we've been doing more or less on a weekly basis, depending on where we're at in our project, kind of a, a weekly Haskell afternoon. Um, but it's maybe maybe fortnightly or monthly is maybe the right regularity at the moment. Um, and just kind of going through stuff and, and working through working through problems. The for me the mix of the real world Haskell and learning your Haskell for great good have, have been really useful. Um, I guess ways of working through it and just getting different ways of explaining the same thing. So you get that kind of pick those two, and then <coughs> sometimes I watch the, the Eric Meyer Channel Nine lectures. Ah, oh, I'm plugging Microsoft stuff. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, there's I guess lots of good tools for learning, and I guess you know, I guess it's a functional programming group, so I probably don't need to say Haskell just seems to be the best one of the good implementations of a statically functional sort of language. And so it's, I guess, a good place to learn and work with and then use it maybe in a different, use a different language. So, conclusion. Functional allows much abstraction. Abstraction's good. It means that you can, you know, not have to write as much stuff. You can reuse your components so much easier. Abstraction means less duplication and less duplication is awesome. End of talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Done. Thanks, Rob. Anyone anyone got any questions? <coughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so are you using Haskell as your, your project language? No, so project language is still Java. Um, we're using Haskell for some of our build tools and some of our, you know, I guess, our internal scripting language. Haskell is one of the, I guess, options that we're exploring at the moment. But yeah, we're not writing our production code in Haskell. Do you use uh, things like Filter, just like on Java, like Google? So we're playing with what our functional libraries are. So we're looking at the, there's the FP. Library. Um, there's Lambda J, which we sort of looked at but haven't really done much with. So, yeah. Some of those clients are very slow in terms of, like, and for me it's JavaScript, so there's a lot of things you can actually apply a functional program. Yep. One of the reasons I come to this group is I'm like, this stuff is really good for, for languages like JavaScript. Yep. But what happens when performance becomes a, a factor? And, you know, the, some, one of the rules, you know, you go back to the, the guys who are writing C games and stuff like that, but it's, it's all about breaking things out to, to their simpler implementations to you know, to get those performance things. I'm trying to see, where's the, is there a middle ground that I can um, go with as such? So we've got, we, we've got a bunch of JavaScript that we're writing. Yeah, so guys written a functional library. Yeah, for using a bit. Um, we'd probably go down the, use the functional approaches to decompose it as much as you can. Yeah. And then the, if you need to optimize, then pull it back in. 
yeah. need to or yeah. I, and I think I guess that's the thing like when I first started writing this particular thing I was doing you know there was a lot of that sort of you know uh, deduplicate pull everything in together yeah. and as as I went down and I was like, man this, this say JavaScript on mobile is slow as a dog so you yeah. keep having to pull it apart pull it apart pull it apart I guess there's libraries out there that might be trying to do that like pre parses and Files for JavaScript that are doing that kind of thing, but yeah, I, don't know. I mean, at some point yeah. it'll get fast enough that this would be, you know, in, in three years' time, I guess, you know, we'd be able to say, go with these patterns, you know, write more maintainable code, more uh, everyone can read it and stuff like that. Um, certainly, some of the stuff that I've had to write is not what I would call readable, um, but it's, it's one of those things, I guess, it's just a, I don't know, sort of asking a question that I don't know if there's an answer to. There is an answer if you leave JavaScript behind. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess I don't believe that's going to be the case. I, I don't well, think we're looking at a future without JavaScript. Yeah, so you said, for example, if JavaScript moved and advanced to some point, we would, we would be able to write this code and, and have the performance. Yeah. And so, you know, that, that's really just a compiler of this job. Yeah. So if we just imagine that we could fast forward time, someone sat down and done all this, we've got a Haskell compiler that does do all this. Yeah. And then, but, but that comes with some caveats, and, and that is that you will not match C performance. No, and, and, that, and that's, yeah. So what's the next best thing, right? And that's not to always write C, and it's not to always write Haskell. It's to have the ability to write that code in a way that ha has the nice properties of maintenance and all that. And when you need to go to the C level and do performance, you make that as easy as possible. Yeah. So I don't know if you've ever used, say, J and I when you're writing Java, for example. I see, the, the, the good thing about me is I've got a very limited Java background. I'm, I'm okay. To see, see so, you know, it, it's, it's got a reputation for being hell. Yeah. It doesn't go up to me. I've, I've dealt with hell. That, that's, yeah. you know, <laughs> in Windows land. So yeah. But it's not an easy problem to solve. And no. so if you just make that interface back down to the native level as easy as possible, yeah. then I would say that's a good answer to the middle ground. And, you know, hopefully JavaScript will up. Well, I think I think the problem is for me is I, I seem to be the one of these people that has, has to live in. I, for some stupid reason, I choose to live in that hellish place of right. performance optimized code, and you know whether that be in certain Windows land or now I'm JavaScript on mobile. I'm like, what am I doing to myself? This is crazy talk. But yeah, yeah, it'd be nice if there was something like you said that could do all this. And even even for people, and I think there's a few people I've seen passionate about CoffeeScript. I haven't got into it, but I think it might be trying to do some of these things. You know, apply some of these patterns. And then you know, keep keep people away from having to get exposed to that uh, hellish existence. Mm, yeah. Good luck, Tom. Yeah. But does Haskell have a nice um, way to get down to the level? <coughs> yeah, it does. It's it's very nice. Yeah. You can get a glance on Haskell. I'm sure that'll take. It. What do you mean? Well, I'm not sign up. Oh, oh yeah, no, there, is, <laughs> there is. There is someone. <laughs> someone has done that. They've written yeah, a Haskell. Haskell to Java. There's a Haskell to JavaScript compiler just yeah, released. It's very experimental. Yeah. <laughs> when I last looked at experimental. They might have changed. Yeah. There's, There's always a difference between like a client Haskell and library Haskell as well. Like yeah. you know, when you're writing a Haskell library, there's a lot of <coughs> the code looks different to the elegant functional code. It's not it's not calling, you know, unsafe perform my all over the place or anything like that necessarily. But it does have different kind of um, I don't know, attributes about it. The looping's done differently. Um, recursion's done differently. There's a bunch of, you know, sort of fragments to the compiler to say you can inline this function. And a bunch of that is changing. And there was a whole bunch of work done on profiles in Haskell, I think about 18 months ago, to be fair that. And um, coming out of that is people are sort of learning what makes Haskell code fast and what makes it slow, which didn't seem to be known so much before. So now there's a whole bunch of performance improvements coming in Haskell libraries. I think that's written it. in Haskell. Yeah, that, that's even. And they're true, getting yeah. much closer to the C performance. So yeah. I, I think JavaScript's in that same place, even though it's crappy, dynamic. You know, talking in this crowd, I'm, I'm saying the right words, so I don't get destroyed. You said it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that, but it, they're, they're in the same place. They're like, holy crap, you know, you, you follow these patterns and whatever it is, but just writes dog slow code. Yeah. It's, not, yeah. it's not been until mobile devices have really shown that up. And, and maybe copy scripts the way up if it can do the optimizations yeah, sure. for you. Instead of, and I think to it, it, it does a little bit on websites. I think it, I think it hides the bad stuff away. Yeah. But it, yeah. it maybe doesn't do the good ones. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, I think Ben, you were just saying the other day that it does efficient array. Yeah, uh, it does. So you can write like maps. You can write maps. Oh, right. Yeah, it does. It, it hides away a few patterns, like it'll give you a list comprehension, and it implements it using JavaScript that looks pretty terrible, and yeah. no variable names, but it's like best practice JavaScript. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, and they're looking to extend that, you know, into the future. So. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, it's pretty good. What be the solution?